Hello, welcome to the Free Will Science and Religion podcast. I'm Chandler Klebs, and I'm here with my, my co-host, George Ortega. Um, it's just the two of us on this particular podcast, and we're going to be talking about why academics such as philosophers and scientists and psychologists and all those fancy people out there with PhDs, why they don't promote the message that free will is an illusion. Are they afraid? Are they afraid of losing financial support from believers in free will? Is, do they fear a breakdown in the morality of society? What is the, the cause, the reason for this? Is it fear? What do you think about it, George? Well, Chandler, that's an excellent question. I think we may need to ask another question uh, in tandem with this. And, and that other question would be, um, do they really understand? Because like many of them have published books, you know, and over, over the course of decades, several books, you know, saying that we have a free will. So like, I think part of the answer might be that they're not promoting the fact that we don't have a free will because very, very mysteriously, very, very curiously, many of them simply don't understand that we don't have a free will. Ah, I think you're right. Um, they, and the, because there are two different definitions, there's the compatibilist and the libertarian. Of course, actually, there's many different compatibilist definitions, too. So it's so confusing and perhaps they don't understand it well enough or know how to explain it well enough. Plus, there is all the, the – like you said, there's books out there saying that, that free will exists while at the same time there's other books saying free will doesn't exist. And so the controversy about this could be another reason. It's sort of like – you know. It, you know, just like the debate about whether God exists or the creationist versus evolution debate, you know, the people are afraid of getting into the controversy of this and making a statement that something does or doesn't exist because out of the white way, they've got tons of people mad at them. Yeah, again, we're trying to figure out, um, you know, because according to basic logic, you know, cause and effect, causality makes free will impossible. But if you try to refute that, as many of them do, then a causality or randomness or prob probabilities, that, that also makes free will impossible. So like the, the basic logic of why free will is impossible is so clear, is so powerful. Now, one, one way to understand how they don't get it is, and, and it's not, you know, we have to like acknowledge that like in a certain way, you know, these acad academics, especially in psychology, they're supposed to be professional. They're supposed to be objective. They're supposed to put aside their personal um, opinions and religious beliefs and, and all and just look at the evidence objectively. But that's not what appears to be happening. Um, <laughs> go, go ahead, Chandler. Yes. The reason that, they, that that's not happening is because it's impossible to be objective. This is something that's weird. People say that we need to be objective and not let our biases um, affect um, the, way, the way we interpret information and communicate it, but it's impossible. That is an example of why we don't have free will. There's no such thing as looking at something objectively because any new information that we read or hear gets filtered through all our experiences in the past related to it. And I think this is an important thing that needs to be pointed out, how nobody is truly objective. Nobody is truly unbiased about anything. What do you think? Chandler, I understand your point, you know, but for example, like in science, for example, like, all right, in math, uh, you know, we, we, we learn that two plus two equals four. Okay. Now, this is our general understanding. And like, you know, it might be for some people that like when you apply this to their finances and they find out that, you know, it doesn't work, you know, in their favor, they want two plus two to equal something else, but it doesn't, you know, two plus two. In other words, like, I think there's some, some quote unquote object, objective facts that are so clear, you know, for example, existence exists, reality exists. I think that's an objective fact and it, it would be, pretty difficult for someone to kind of like, you know, overcome that through their emotional needs or something, you know? So, so I, I think what I'm saying is that like, 
yes, while we, we can't be completely free from influences of our emotions and our needs and stuff, in some, you know, related to some basic understandings of reality, I think that it should be fairly, fairly easy to just overcome that and just like, you know, um, basically just abide by, the, by the, the clear logic of whatever it is we're exploring. Ah, I see your point exactly, George, um, because here's the thing. It, even though it's true that we can't really be free of our biases, there are objective facts which we can observe which are not subject to human interpretation or bias or opinion or whatever. Two plus two uh, equals four, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. You know, so I get what you're saying, and this is actually very important because I want to mention in the debate about morality, people debate is objective is morality an objective fact observable and demonstrable by science, or is it just some matter of opinion? which is kind of the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And here's why that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And maybe you'll understand this, is that first of all, our opinions can be explained scientifically because everything has a cause. And there's going to be a cause for our opinions and our biases too. So there's still objectivity even when things appear to be subjective. Yeah, no, I agree. And sometimes with morality, okay, like, and, and we should like pull back to the free will thing after this, but morality, like it really depends on how you define it to, to know whether it is or not. For example, like um, this British philosopher, John Locke defined goodness as that which creates happiness. Now to me, that def definition sounds very accurate, you know, but the problem for us is that, like, you know, a lot of times we don't know whether what we do is going to create more happiness or less. Um, let me just briefly, there's this, there's this parable of, of um, three men that go to a wise man in their village to, and ask them a certain question. What happened was this, this boy was given a horse, you know, as a gift. And these three men want to know if that was a good thing or a bad thing that the, 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 the boy is given a horse. So basically, they go to the wise man, and the wise man says, wait and see. That's his answer, right? Let's see. And so here's what happens. So like, all right, you know, a few days or whatever goes by, and, go, and then like the boy falls off the horse, breaks his arm. Okay, then they go back to the, the wise man, and they ask him, they say, well, I guess it must have been a bad thing that he's gotten the horse because of this, right? So he says, wait and see. So then all of a sudden, yeah, so, so the, region, the region all of a sudden gets involved in a war and everybody has to go off to, to war. and People are like getting killed and, and injured and stuff. But this boy that has a broken arm doesn't go off to a war and so he's saved from that. And then they go back to the wise men and say, oh, it must have been a good thing. And then he says, wait and see. Now, I don't know how the rest of it goes, but you can see that a lot of times we just can't know what's going to be ultimately, you know, for the good or not. Oh, uh, I, 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 I get the moral of the story, George. This is very interesting because I, I totally get what you're saying here because I generally agree that, you know, morality is, you know, good is whatever creates the most happiness. And yet we can't always know what's going to make us happier, whether us or other people around us, what will make us all happier in the end. So that's the thing that's interesting and because then we get into the subject of uncertainty and how it's our lack of knowledge of the future and how what we're doing now will affect the future. And yet our, our, our will is not free from our predictions and beliefs that doing this will be good or bad in the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So, so getting back to like, you know, why these academics don't understand this. Um, again, there, there's several possibilities and I don't think they're either or they could be like mixed together. Um, one is like, like you, you suggested to begin with that they kind of get it. They get that, that um, free will is an illusion, but the free will belief is so ensconced in our society, you know, religions promoted and just like it's, it's so, you know, firmly established that they are afraid to go against the establishment. That, that makes sense. 
But in other words, like this need, this need to kind of like be upstanding citizens and like respected in their communities and their colleges and all trumps their understanding of reasoning. Yes, and I, I understand this, George, because, you know, there's a certain fear, um, and, th and this is something that's experienced. Like, let's say that you no longer believe the religion that you grew up in. You are afraid of people knowing that because they will treat you bad, and they'll try to convert you and all sorts of stuff. And there's also another thing, and I figure I, – I, this is an example of something that's highly dangerous. If you're somebody who for moral reasons is against – eating meat or other animal products because of animal suffering, well then the, the, the massive majority of the carnivorous culture, well they just think you're crazy. And this is something I've experienced, like, well what's wrong with you? Everybody eats meat. And I'm like, no, no, please, no. It's like, and so this is, it's, there's a certain fear involved when you are challenging a tradition that's gone on for longer than you can imagine and everybody is part of this, it's sort of like you don't want to be in that position of having to explain why you will not eat Burger King and McDonald's, you know? You don't want to be put in that position. And so a lot of people cave in. They just give up on vegetarianism or veganism and just go ahead and eat the way everybody else is just to avoid the conflict, the fear of challenging that. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of times it has to do with kind of like, yeah, not being ridiculed, not, be, not being kind of like, you know, thought badly of by other people. And, and we have kind of like, in, in order to kind of like understand how we may need to address the, this, what has worked in the past, I think we may need to look to um, Darwin and evolution. You know, back in the 1860s, he proposed this, this really dramatically different perspective on who we are as human beings. I mean, like before that, pretty much everyone believed in the Garden of Eden or, you know, this a religious creation story. And all of a sudden, he had this very, very kind of like challenging belief that we evolved from ape-like creatures and from lower organisms. And like for a lot of people, you can imagine how threatening that was to their self perception, their self-identity. Now, now, I think what he did, what, what happened was that like he got the um, understanding and the acknowledgement of his theory um, by the academic community. In other words, the scholars, the leaders of, of, of academia at the time, they understood it and accepted it. And then what happened, so like the average person, in order to not be... Um, considered ignorant or uneducated or, or whatever, I think they adopted the academics view because like, you know, it would have been like very risky for them not to. So you understand how like, I think in terms of like getting, um, again, like with the academics, I think what we may need to do is target the very, very top of the field, you know, who, who most other academics within the field respect and get their acceptance and their acknowledgement for then the the, uh, the less established academics and then the general public to really you know n fearing ridicule feeling fearing being on the wrong side of this kind of thing then overcome this kind of resistance they are to to really looking at the objective facts how does that sound yeah so what you're saying is we really need to be targeting the academics first and then they will be able to educate the general public I, I, Chandler, I think that may, that may be an approach. I mean, right now with our promotions, we have been like targeting, you know, the general public in general, I think to create a buzz, to get, get people talking about it. You know, in other words, because like academics a lot of times will not devote their time and attention to causes that they perceive are, are not perhaps of interest to the general population or, or you know, said otherwise, like if they know that the public is really, really interested in a, in a topic, that'll give them more motivation to, to, you know, to study it. I see. Yeah. So it goes both ways because if the general public becomes interested in something, well, that also affects what the academics will do. Exactly.
So, so both are good. Both are important. Yeah, and, and again, like, you know, with our promotion, we've been targeting the public. We, you know, we'd, we may want to try to figure out a way to p target the um, academia a bit more, you know, more directly. And, and, you know, like, I don't know, you've read my book, uh, Free Will, Climate, uh, it, it's Society, what is it, Free Will, It's Reputation, Societal Role, and, and um, Societal Cost and Role in Climate Change Denial. So um, that may be an approach. In other words, like, academia for the most part, may have, like, may not be studying this, taking this seriously, because they haven't thought about it enough to realize how fundamentally important it is to our society in general. So I think, I think if we can, like, you know, use a, an issue like climate change, climate change denial, and, and, and get them to understand that the, the more people believe in free will, the more people are going to feel guilty and blamed for climate change and the more that's likely going to motivate them to deny it, you know, which, which doesn't help anyone, doesn't help our world. That might be, you know, a kind of way of, of getting these academics to be interested in this. Yes, this is very interesting. And, and here's an interesting objection that I hear from the other side, you know, the free will side, um, is they say that when we push for social change, saying that people, you know, should not eat animals, saying that people should try to fight climate change, you know, whatever the change may be, changes in the criminal justice system, people say, well, how can you say that humans have no choice and then tell them to choose? And <laughs> this is the most stupid thing I've ever heard. We're not telling you what, we're not telling you to choose. We're telling you what you, you should do if you want a happy world. <laughs> And if you if you understand what we're saying and believe us, then you will change. <laughs> well, Chandler, let's go over this because, like, you know, a friend of my brother's. I have a brother who's one of his best friends is a Harvard, you know, um, oncologist. I think he's he's got a, he's got a PhD in Harvard and all, and he actually made that same kind of statement. So this is something that apparently even like very educated people don't understand. Explain to to our audience why our having are not having a free will and and being able to kind of like champion social change and do things just just go in line or or, or possible basically the it's because we don't have a free will and that our our so-called decisions change based on the information we have because if you don't know that climate change is happening well then you're obviously not going to be motivated to do anything about it but if you find out that it is happening, well, then you you automatically, if you don't think it sounds good, you will. That's your your question is going to be, well, what can I do? You know. And so if you find out that there's something you can do to um, to help it, well, then you will. And if you're a person who wants the earth to burn up and the and and the sea level to rise twenty something feet and flood everyone, if you want that to happen, well then you still aren't gonna do anything to fight climate change, obviously. But it's those who already care about the planet, already care about life on the planet, that when combined with the knowledge of what's going on, they will change. They their behavior will change because of the information. That information and the truth becomes a causal influence on them. Okay, that's excellent. That's, you know, and like, let me, let me try to just um, do that kind of explanation in different words, because like what I've found, you know, from leading like dozens and dozens of meetup groups on this and discussions is that like people really need to hear these kinds of explanations really over and over sometimes before they really, really sink in. So basically what we're saying is like, yeah, we don't have a free will, but what we do matters. In other words, like, let's say people, let's say we, our world needs to go vegan in order to uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, now people, sometimes people say, well, if we don't have a free will, then we can't do that. And then again, that, that's completely mistaken because basically what happens is like, because we don't have a free will, we don't get to decide whether or not not we will promote that and then the people who we're promoting it to you know don't get to decide of their free will whether they're going to accept it or not but what happens is like you know reality will either you know cause us to promote that idea and it be accepted and and um 
things evolve from there or not in this line. And like just the example of evolution is a perfect um, way of illustrating this. Um, because um, Darwin didn't have a free will, it really wasn't up to him that he has, has, um, discovered this theory. And it really wasn't up to him that he was able to kind of like um, promote it, that he was able to like write it convincingly. And then it wasn't up to the academians that he wrote it to, that they were up, able to understand it and accept it. And then it wasn't up, really up to the, the public who doesn't have a free will whether they would accept what academia was telling them about evolution, but that was what was determined to happen. Nobody there had a free will, but a major shift in our perspective of who we are as human beings happened about. So basically we're trying to say, yes, nobody has a free will, but that does not mean that we can't change our behaviors in society in, in monumental ways. Yes, I agree. And to use one more example, I like to use the game of chess as an example. Understanding that you don't have a free will does not paralyze you and keep you from moving the chess pieces. Rather, if you understand how the game works and you want to win the game, then you have to move the pieces in the way that will lead to that effect. And what this also means that your moves are dependent upon your opponent's moves. And so that's the thing to understanding is it's this cause and effect and a relation between everything that's happening. And so change happens because change is inevitable. The only thing that doesn't change is change itself. And so people act like having a free will is required for things to change. And I'm like, that's stupid. The, the earth r rotates and, and goes around the sun and every, uh, and a ball rolls. I mean, things change. I mean, things change. Um, but that change is not free from the causes of those changes. And I do think we will see changes in the world. And in, in fact, I really think we kind of have to, because at a certain point, the worse a problem gets, the, the, the more obvious it becomes that it's happening and people are less able to deny it. And so I think that the climate change denial is eventually going to just, it's going to reduce dramatically as the climate gets worse and worse. I agree. And, and in terms of change, you know, some, some people, again, they're, they're saying that like that this free will issue, that it just doesn't really matter that, you know, whether we know it, um, that we have a free will or not. Now, I just want to explore this relative to like, First, relative to this, this statement that this eminent American philosopher said, his name is John Searle. In, in, um, he's listed in, in terms of like philosophers who were born after 1900. He's ranked number 13 in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy as the philosopher who's been like, you know, in, in ranked as, 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 as someone who's been like cited by other philosophers more frequently than, than, than others. So basically, he was like interviewed by this psychologist, Susan Blackmore, about free will. And basically, he said that, you know, if our world was to acknowledge that, that free will is an illusion, that we don't have free will, that would be, in his words, like I'm quoting, a bigger revolution in our th thinking than Einstein or Copernicus or Galileo or Newton or Darwin. Now, Chandler... When, when he says something like that, what, why do you think he said that? Well, I think there are many reasons. And for one thing, it affects your everyday life. You know, wh whether the earth is the center of the universe or, or certain things like that, a and even the creation revolution, like it doesn't really, I don't think that affects your day-to-day -day life and stuff. But understanding the causes of your behavior and why you're doing what you do causes a type of reflection and education about knowing yourself and knowing others that's unlike anything we've experienced before. And it means changes in law. It means changes in religion. It means all sorts of changes in everything. And so what I think we'll see is that we'll see our politics and religion line up with what science is already telling us. It will become part of our psychology, part of our knowledge, and people will see the importance of this because it's just so obvious. Um, and I think it's, it really is a big thing um, because otherwise, if you don't understand it, 
then you tend to just attribute what people do like, oh, they just chose to do it. And then someone asks, well, why did they choose to do it? Oh, no reason they chose. And that's the kind of conversations I've, I've had with people. And it's just the stupidest thing ever. And yeah, seriously, um, yes, there, there's got to be a cause. And I want people to get that message. You're right, Chandler. So like basically you're, you've just described a very pragmatic rationale for the world understanding that free will is an illusion. In other words, to the extent that we understand nobody has a free will, when people do things, we're, we're going to be looking for the causes of why they did things, when we do things. And one way that could be extremely helpful, for example, like here in the United States, we have a huge problem with crime. We, we incarcerate more many more of our citizens than any other country in the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's really horrible. And so like what happens with the free will belief, you know, society condemns and indicts, indicts the criminals. So they just, you know, basically say, well, this is a bad person. That explains everything. And so we're going to like punish the person, lock them up. And, you know, that's all we can do. And unfortunately, that doesn't work because what happens is like people do what they do, again, not having a free will to a large extent because of how society is, how society is structured and all. So in terms of this, the better we understand that we don't have a free will, the more we're going to like look for the causes of why people do what they do. And that's going to help us like reform not just individuals, but reform the society within which individuals live and that actually conditions individuals to attack the way they do. So this is just one example of the, the really, really powerful influence understanding that we don't have a free will can have not just on this country, but across the world. Yes, and, and I agree because it's very practical because otherwise you become what I call a free will fatalist. And I've talked about this before. The idea like if you believe that there's no causes behind the choices people are, are making, well, then you, there's nothing you can do about it. There's a problem because if there's no cause for it, well, then how in the world do you do you make change? So what I, so what I'm saying is that knowledge that everything has causes actually helps us make the changes that we already want to do. The point is we did not choose to want to fight climate change. And you know what I'm saying? We didn't choose that. Um, we already were people who wanted to do that. And it's the knowledge of determinism and the causality that allows us to make those changes more effectively. Absolutely. Because, like, you know, it's only when we explore, you know, the causes of, of the phenomenon we're, we're looking at or the causes of why we 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 believe in it or don't believe in it or you know have a certain understanding about it the the the, the more understanding we have about those causes the better able, able we are to navigate how we address these issues absolutely yes this really is the biggest thing ever and so i agree with john searle and and chandler i think so we we we've just been exploring kind of like some you know very powerful pragmatic applications of this understanding. But I, I think this is even this this also addresses something maybe much more fundamental. It, and it, it's similar to what Darwin did. Darwin again gave us like a worldview of ourselves that, you know, we evolved from single celled organisms, you know, ultimately. I mean like that's amazing. That's that's mind blowing. And so like what we're saying to the world is like the world is completely diluted about who we are as human beings. You know, basically the world believes that we, what we, we human beings do and think and feel and say is really fundamentally up to us when that's the complete opposite of how it is. In other words, to the, to the, to the extent the world finally comes to understand that absolutely nothing is up to us, that this is really a movie, we're just roles, we're just going along, whatever. That is such a huge uh, understanding in terms of the, the basic truth of who we are as human beings. Yes, it really is a change in who we are and why we do what we do. And it removes the um, I am better than you attitude. Basically, the arrogance 
because we think that we're better than somebody else because we have more money or because we're talented or because we're taller or, or wider or we're a different gender or of a different religion than them. And we blame them like, well, hey, you could be as good as me if you chose to. And I'm like, the, people are so deluded. They are so deceived. And no good really comes from false beliefs. That, that's the way I look at it.